All right, so now I'd like to discuss um, how the probe beam actually gets turned into an electrical signal. Um, so this is an important part of the design of a TDTR system, or an, at least an important part of understanding how big your, si your signal should be. Um, all right, so basically the way that this is collected on every system I've ever seen is using photodiodes. There are different types of photodiodes, and I'll cover a couple of different types here. Um, but um, generally, this is a, a semiconductor that's going to convert the laser power into an electrical current. Um, and the only difference between different types of photodiodes is that some of them employ different balancing acts to reduce noise or different types of amplification that are built in. But um, the most basic way to do this, which I, is basically the what I would call the David Cahill way of doing things, um, that uh, works pretty well is to just use a biased photodiode or a photodetector. Um, the classic example is the Thor Labs um, DET 10A biased uh, silicon photodiode, which works pretty well um, at the wavelengths um, that people are typically interested in. Let me grab my laser pointer here for a second. All right, so basically the goal is to have a, um, a photodetector that turns light into current. Um, so usually when you when you go to the website of a uh, provider of one of these photodiodes, they'll usually provide a responsivity chart like the one that I've drawn here. So what this thing does is it tells you how many amps of current will be generated for a given wattage of light um, entering um, the photodiode. And so different detectors have different responsivities. Um, and um, you can see that if you're using the DET 10A, or actually this is the second version of the DET 10A, um, that's the red curve here, and typically you'd be operating pretty close to 800 nanometers. So the responsivity is something like 0.45 amps per watt. Um, so this thing will, will generate you know, 0.45 amps if one watt of light hits it. Of course, we're generally not working with one watt of light, we're generally working with milliwatts. But, um, okay, so that's great. So it generates an amp of current, you know, or a given amperage of current per wattage of input. Um, generally what you do, so in practice, um, these things are often, like, so for example, a lock-in amplifier has what's called a 50 ohm terminal, which is essentially a 50 ohm resistor that your current will run through, and that generates the voltage signal that you see. So generally, if you're trying to figure out what kind of voltage you're going to see on your lock-in amplifier, um, what you would do is assume that your lock-in amplifier has a 50 ohm terminal, which most of them do, um, or just assume, or you know, most of these things are designed, even if you're not sending it directly to a to a lock-in amplifier, that however you run the circuit after it leaves the photodiode, it, it's expecting to see a 50 ohm impedance um, for optimal performance generally. Um, so anyway, generally th that assumes that there's a 50 ohm terminating voltage, uh, terminating resistance, which um, generates your voltage signal. So let me run through a fun example of, you know, how much, how much thermal signal do I expect to see using a DET 10A um, detector for a typical TDTR system. Okay, so let's imagine that I have a probe beam um, here. So this is a probe beam right before, so this is the probe beam right before it enters the microscope objective. Let's suppose it has a probe beam power of uh, six milliwatts. This is pretty typical um, in my experience for what type of power you would use if you weren't restricted to by burning your sample or anything. Um, so, you know, a probe beam power of six milliwatts on the probe beam. Um, so that is going to go into the this uh, microscope objective, bounce off the sample. The sample itself has a reflectivity of only about 90% in most cases. Um, the most typical surf top surface would be aluminum. And um, in that case, aluminum has a reflectivity of 90%. Um, that light would go back through the microscope objective and come back out. Um, you would lose about half of that light at a non-polarizing beam splitter, so that's a 50-50 beam splitter on the way back. So when the probe beam is on its way back to the photodiode, um, you would lose about 50% of that light, and then it would enter the photodiode. Um, so the 
the probe power when it enters the photodiode would be something like the reflectivity of the sample times 50% because you're going to lose 50% of the beam splitter times whatever the original power was before it went into the um, to the microscope objective. Okay, so that's nice, but how? Okay, so in this case, that's a little bit less than six mil, or that would be like something like 2.4 milliwatts or something like that. Um, so 50% would give you 3 milliwatts, and then 90% of that I think will give you something like 2.4 milliwatts. Um, so that's not really the question I'm interested in because the, the DC power is not actually related to the signal. Um, what I'm looking for is the fluctuations in the probe intensity that happen due to the fluctuations in temperature on the sample. Okay, so let me make some reasonable assumptions about what might happen there. Um, so let's suppose that our pump beam is designed such that it creates about a one Kelvin temperature rise on the sample. This is pretty ideal. I think in most situations it's not actually quite that large, but um, let, let's assume that we're creating about a one Kelvin temperature fluctuation on the surface of our sample, and that's what we're trying to probe with our probe beam. Well. For aluminum, which is one of the best thermoreflectance transducers, the um, reflectivity changes by about two parts out of 10,000 um, per Kelvin of temperature rise. And so I can convert the, you know, in order to figure out what the fluctuations in probe power are that are arriving on the surface, what I do is I take the fluctuations in the reflectivity and then I multiply them by whatever the base level um, DC power that would be showing up on the um, detector would be. Um, and I can turn, I can relate that to temperature by taking the fluctuation in temperature on the surface times the, you know, how much the reflectivity changes per temperature on the surface of our sample. And so this is how big our, um, we, we expect the fluctuations in laser power to be on the uh, surface or on the on the photodiode due to the temperature fluctuations on our sample. Okay, so what I'd like to do is convert that into voltage, but first let's calculate what that number is. Um, so the amount that the like the the amount that the probe uh, intensity fluctuates due to the changes in temperature on the sample can be calculated using that formula. So that's the thermoreflectance coefficient times the one Kelvin temperature fluctuation on the sample, times the actual reflectivity of the sample, um, times the loss, you know, that happens at the, um, you know, the, the loss that happens at the non-polarizing beam splitter, times the original power um, of the probe beam when it went into the microscope objective. So if you do all that math and run through all of the losses and reductions, um, you'll find that that's about 4.5 or 5.4 um, times 10 to the minus 7 watts, um, which is a small number, but it's hard to appreciate how small the number that is. Um, okay, so let's convert that power into the amount of current, that the current fluctuations being generated by our photodetector. Well, that's actually pretty easy to do. All we need to do is take the fluctuations in light intensity and multiply them by this thing, the responsivity that came from this graph. Um, so for our graph, um, we're operating somewhere around, I'd say, 0.45 amps per watt. So if I convert, you know, if I use the sensitivity of my um, photodiode, that means that I'll be generating an AC um, current of something like 2.4 10 to the minus 7 amps. Um, so something, something less than a microamp. Okay, so what is that as a voltage? So if I take 2.4 e to the minus 7 amps and I run it through a 50 ohm resistor, I expect to get voltage, you know, my, I expect my signal to be something like 12 microvolts um, of signal. And so um, that's pretty big. I mean, it's okay. That would be measurable, I would say, using a, a good lock and amplifier. Um, but generally, people try to do better than this. Um, to give you some kind of sense, typically, at the bandwidths that people operate lock and amplifiers and you know at sort of in the range that we are right now one typically expects noise levels in the lock and amplifiers to be of the several hundred nanovolt um, kind of range 
And so if you're trying to get a high signal to noise ratio, um, what I've drawn here is probably enough, but it's kind of borderline. I'd really like to have more. And so um, let me walk you through some ways that um, people try to improve this, even using this standard DET 10A system. Okay.